Hello, and welcome back to our study of the Sermon on the Mount. If you have your Bibles, you want to open those up to Matthew chapter 6. We are in the middle of a series of statements that Jesus has made to the people that are listening, mainly his disciples, but others that are along there uh, in the mountaintop with him. Uh, the crowds have gathered around, as we saw at the beginning of chapter 5. And the three acts of righteousness that he's been talking about, the idea of giving, the idea of praying, and then the idea of fasting— all are given in the context of doing it so as to actually glorify God and receive the reward from God that he would want us to have, not doing it for the praise of people so that we would receive that reward. When we talked about prayer, we talked about not doing it with a type of babbling that goes on, um, on and on like the Gentiles, thinking that because of their words, their long words, their repeated words, that they would get what they want from God, uh, but also not to do it publicly in the sense of getting praise from people by seeing how much we pray. We mentioned in the previous lesson that what we want to do is pray in such a way as to glorify God and that we would see his words. We didn't talk about the prayer that we're going to look at today because we wanted to give special emphasis to this discussion on its own. It's worth its own discussion. And so we want to add to that. And I think it's wise on the part of the lesson writers to separate this out. And so what we did is we talked about the idea of not doing it publicly so as to be seen, not doing it with actually vain babblings or repetitions, as some translations say, like the Gentiles do, thinking that we can basically convince God by our repeated words. There we made two comments, though. We also said that doesn't mean not to pray in public at all, and it doesn't mean that we don't um, pray persistently. Uh, this is not a lesson in that in detail. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a in a subsequent lesson, but the point is that those things as in and of themselves aren't right. They're not wrong in and of themselves to repeat our prayers or to uh, pray publicly. We talked about corporate prayer and the like. In fact, what we're going to look at in today's prayer is a corporate type of prayer anyway. Uh, the title of the lesson is Praying Like Jesus, and the fact is that Jesus prayed. Um, the corresponding prayer uh, or corresponding uh, occurrence of this teaching about prayer is in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. You want to go back and read that. There, what prompts the teaching about the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is that the disciples see Jesus pray. And when he gets done praying, they say, Lord, teach us to pray as John, John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And so we see a truncated version of that prayer in verse or chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Um, We'll talk more about another passage in a moment as we go through the text. But when we say praying like Jesus, certainly we want to have a prayer life like Jesus. He was in or in in, uh, in relationship with his father to the extent such that he would read, he would pray and pray and pray. And there are other places we can talk about that Jesus prayed over and over again. We can look at the the gospels and see that he was a praying person. He was in communion with the Father. So in that sense. We would say that we want to be praying like Jesus. In another sense, however, we want to pray like Jesus teaches us to pray. Um, there are certain things in this prayer, perhaps, that we might say um, Jesus doesn't need to pray. Uh, we'll talk about that as we get there. But by and large, praying like Jesus is the sense that we commune with the Father, that we have conversation with the Father. We hear from Him in His Word, and we speak back to Him uh, in words of adoration and praise and petition. We'll talk about that as we go forward as well. So in that respect, when we talk about praying like Jesus, we're talking about having a prayer life like Jesus. And we know at the start of all of this that uh, to say have a prayer life like, prayer life like Jesus uh, might seem to be defeatist at the get-go. And that's not really what I'm trying to do at all. What I'm trying to do is see Jesus as setting the pattern and you've probably heard the adage, well, if Jesus needed to pray, don't you think we need to pray? How much more do we need to pray? And I get that. Um, Jesus had a relationship with the Father that we can seek to emulate, and that is we have conversation with the Father. So that's what we mean by praying like Jesus. Certainly, there may be an element or two in this prayer that Jesus would not need to pray himself. Well, I want to read the text, and the reason for that is that while I have the Lord's Prayer memorized, and I'm sure that you do as well, I'm reading from the New American Standard 2020 edition, and there is a little bit of wording that we want to look at. But then, along with other modern translations, you may find something interesting about the way the prayer is related that we want to talk about that we often don't think about when we actually pray the prayer 
because of the influence of the King James Bible as well as other translations. And we'll talk about that as we get there. So one of the things we need to recognize is that in the midst of the acts of righteousness, what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, teaching us how to be kingdom disciples, he's teaching us how to have communion with the Father, do the right things, give, pray, and fast. Do them for the right reasons. And as we get to prayer, a specific prayer that Jesus gives us today, what we want to do is seek to think about the things that we want to talk to God about, and then what would be the attitude that we do as we pray. And then lastly, as we look at the text, I'm going to look at, you, look at an outline with you in a moment. We're going to see that Jesus takes special emphasis in a part of the prayer that he expands on and gives us warning. And it's a pretty stern warning. And it can be kind of a, a scary warning. But I think it's important to note what Jesus says here. And it's going to be along those themes that I've said throughout the discussion of the Sermon on the Mount. And that is Jesus asks us to do hard things. He doesn't give us something light in this respect. Discipleship is a challenge. Uh, we do know of passages like Matthew 11, where it talks about, you know, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We understand what that means. But clearly, when it comes to being a disciple, there are certain things that Jesus would demand of us, and rightly so, because he is Lord of the universe. He's making us think about what it is to be a disciple, a kingdom disciple, what it means to stand out. And I think that means, even in this sense, what it means to stand out in our prayer life, communion with the Father, but also how that affects our relationship with one another. So, um, Let's go ahead and look at the the uh, the text itself, and then I'll go through the outline with you. It's a pretty basic outline, nothing flashy, and then we'll go through the text uh, verse by verse, phrase by phrase even. So let me go ahead and read that to you. Again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 edition. We're in the middle of Jesus correcting and warning against acting like the hypocrites in their acts of righteousness. We have this expansion then on prayer, and I think it's a very important expansion. The text reads this way. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. You already recognize a couple of things that may be a little bit controversial here with what I read and the way I read it. And then, um, of course, what Jesus says after that with regard to forgiveness. Well, let's go ahead. And what I'd like to do is take a moment to go through the text with you by an outline. So let's take a look at that outline. First, we have the introduction. Uh, you then pray like this. There's a reason the way I put it that way. Um, verse 9. That's the first part of verse 9. Then the core of the prayer, there are two parts. The first is pray for God's name, reign, and will, verses 9b and 10. And then pray for our provision, our forgiveness, and our protection, and a specific kind of protection at this point, verses 11 through 13. And then strong words on forgiving others, verses 14 to 15. So let's go ahead and take a look at this section by section. Now, I think it's important to recognize as we go through the text that uh, we want to focus on every little phrase here. There are certain elements here that when we unpack it, reveal a lot of things. Uh, with that in mind, I would say that uh, you would do well perhaps to do more study on the Lord's Prayer, not only here in Matthew's version, but Luke's version. There are issues of you know, the timing of Jesus teaching the disciples that prayer in that context versus the Sermon on the Mount here. We won't have time to get into that. Um, there might be an opportunity for it a little bit, but the point that I'm making here is that there are a number of different levels that we can study this prayer. 
Uh, one is the different contexts. Um, my first thought is, if Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer here, then why later in Jesus' ministry do the disciples ask him to pray, and then he gives them basically the same prayer? Um, but there's that level, the background level. Uh, another level is to look at each phrase, and we're going to do that and see what that means. Where I'm going with all of that, though, is there are many, many resources out there. Many, many people in history, significant individuals in history, have not only worked through the prayer uh, in such a way as to uh, look at its meaning, but also to teach us devotionally uh, how to walk through the prayer. And so you'll find lots of small and large books alike that deal with walking through the what we call the Lord's Prayer, uh, what's common in the Lord's Prayer, what might best be known as the model prayer. But the point is that what Jesus is giving us here is very significant and has meant a lot to a lot of people. And many have written on this and we can muse on this and we can continue to meditate on this. The key thing is focusing on what it means to commune with the Father. So let's take a look at this and I'll, I'll stop giving illusory language and we'll just walk through the text. Verse 9. Jesus says, pray then in this way. I really want to stop at that point because there's more going on here. In the original, Jesus uses the word you directly, you, the you plural, you then. So we'll look at the then and the therefore. Pray in this way or pray like this. Now, first, the idea of the you. Now, some translations are going to put that you there, some aren't. In English, you know that the imperative, when you give a command, doesn't require that you use the pronoun when you give that command. However, it can be done in such a way as to give emphasis or contrast. In Greek, you can use the pronoun um, with the imperative, and it will carry that idea of contrast. Again, you don't need the pronoun there, but a lot of times with a an imperative, you can see that there. But what's striking is that we need to bear in mind that Jesus is in the middle of teaching about the wrong way, the wrong mindset, and the wrong motive, and the wrong method, if you will, about prayer. Talking about, one, the hypocrites, and two, the Greeks or the Gentiles, when talking specifically about prayer here. So what Jesus then does, and what we have in verse 9, is turn it back to the people that are listening, his disciples and the crowds that have gathered. And he basically is making this contrast. You there for pray in this way. So the you is emphatic. What he's saying is they pray this way, but when it comes to your prayer, whenever you pray, do it this way. So here is the direct command. Earlier when it says whenever you pray, it's more like we know you're going to pray. Here's what you want to think about as you pray, going into your closet praying, and then just praying knowing your father knows what you have need of before you ask. Here in the contrast to the hypocrites and the Gentiles, Jesus says, you. The you, again, is emphatic. It's in contrast to those that he's just been talking about. He says, when you pray, you're going to pray this way. And so when he gets ready to give what we call the Lord's Prayer, he says, you pray. Before he says, you pray, he says, therefore, or then. Um, that word there is in what we call an inferential and it's the idea of an inferential transition or conjunction in that it's giving the reason, therefore. Now, sometimes it just means then consecutively, but I think there's a combination of that going on here. In other words, he's not only just going on to the next point, he's, he's giving us a therefore, indicating there is a difference in the way we're going to pray. You, therefore, in light of what the hypocrites do, in light of what the Gentiles do in their prayer, therefore, or so then, you pray. So we have um, a reference here to what Jesus is doing with the prayer. In light of what was just said about the hypocrites and Gentiles, you pray this way. And then the phrase there in this way is a another adverb that means like this. It's a word that uses the word this in many ways. It's the same word that is used when it says that God so loved the world. The word so there is in this way. In this way, God loved the world. What we're seeing here then is Jesus giving instruction that would in, would include a kind of content prayer, but also there's a sense that as we look at the words, uh, we sense what Jesus is saying from the content of the words, there's a certain attitude, there's a certain focus, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Now, I know that you have this prayer memorized, many do, I do in a different 
translation. Um, and it's something that can be prayed as a prayer itself. Uh, and many times you've experienced this in corporate settings. Perhaps you have prayed this as an individual. What we want to recognize is that while this is a guide to content, it is not formulaic. It's not a formula. There's nothing wrong with reciting it and praying it as it is. In fact, we're going to pray this again at the end of our session. And while I think it's valid to say it serves as a kind of template, the point of a template there is to give you guidance on what to include. It doesn't mean limit your prayer just to these things. And it doesn't mean that this becomes some kind of magic mantra or formula so that you would be able to then just say it and God does what you ask him to do. There's certainly a guideline here, and I like the word template because it does say that while we can pray these words, we need to recognize that they are a guide of the things that we want to include in our prayer when we pray. So we're going to recap verse 9 real quick. You, in contrast to the hypocrites and the Greeks, pray, therefore, in light of their ways of praying, you then pray. And the word pray is an imperative. It's not only assume that they're going to pray. His point is, you're going to pray and pray in this way. This is the way you would want to pray in this way, with these kinds of ideas in mind, with this attitude, and with these words and these concepts, pray. And we know that there are many other prayers in the Bible, not only by Jesus specifically, but also others throughout the New Testament, like Paul and prayer in the Bible. And so we have many, many op options and opportunities there to look at prayer. We, we perhaps could do a whole series on prayer, and we've done that in the past. But what we want to do is focus on here what Jesus is saying with regard to prayer as he is now teaching a basic kind of prayer and what would be included in prayer. So let's take a look at that. We're going to look at section B, what I called B, pray for God's name, reign, and well. Like I said, there's nothing really fancy about the outline. I'm not trying to be cute with this. The point, though, that I'm making is that the prayer is divided up easily into two sections of three types of petitions or content or topics to pray about. So again, verses 9b through 10, it says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First, let's talk about the opening address. What's interesting here is that it wasn't unusual for Jews to think of God as Father. The Old Testament has reference to God as Father. He has Father-like qualities. He is their creator, but he's also their Father in covenant. It seems what Jesus does is offer up a way of relating to God as Father that is a lot different and more intimate. Now, he's still using corporate language. It's still the plural, our Father. There's still the idea of doing this in community and recognizing that while we do pray on an individual level, there is the idea of praying publicly or praying corporately as well. But I think it's, it's important to note that. So there's the our part. And then I do want to focus in on the idea of Father. Paul picks up on this theme of Father. He says it's because of the Holy Spirit that we can call him Abba, Father. There's that personal relationship that we have. It's, again, not only individual, but corporate. And so I don't want to split those up, but I want to keep that in mind. It's both as an individual, but as a group of people. But we can call him Father in a way Jesus refers to Father in a much more intimate way than what may have been understood with God being the Father of the Jewish nation. He is Father. He is the one who guides and protects. And I do want to say it at the outset here, because I won't want to belabor the point, but I want, don't want to miss the point either. I know that when we talk about God as Father, for many people, that is not a good image. They've had bad fathers or no fathers. And so to think of God as Father is a kind of a hindrance to having a relationship with God because of what they have in experiencing father, fatherhood. Let me say it this way, and I think it's very important. We do not judge God as Father based on our experience with fathers. Rather, what we do is we judge fathers, human fathers, in light of what example God has given us as Father. He is the perfect Father. And I know that's hard to think of because of our own experiences. I just want to give you an encouragement that 
when we talk about as when we talk about God as Father, we're talking about God as Father in the perfect sense. He is the perfect Father. He is everything a father was meant to be, and he models that, and you can see that throughout Scripture, his care and protection, and at times discipline, yes, but always, as the writer to Hebrew says, discipline means we know we're his children because a father disciplines his children. If you're not disciplined, then the worry is that he doesn't care enough to discipline. The point that I'm making here is that we want to have our focus on God as father as the perfect father. And then as we think about that, we don't, we, we, rec we recognize and expect imperfections in our fathers. And I know that there are many who have experienced fathers in a very negative way. I don't want that to be a hindrance to your understanding what it means that God is father and we call him father. He is the perfect father. He is the one who does the things that um, even an evil father will do, but beyond that. And there are other places we'll talk about that later on in the Sermon on the Mount as well. We talk about God as Father. We talk about God as Father. We're talking about who the one who protects us, the one who is providing for us, the one who is there to give us guidance and so forth. Our Father. But one of the things I want to key in on here is Jesus is focusing in on that intimate relationship. Now, I'm going to say it now, and maybe you don't like it. Uh, we hear the word Abba as meaning Daddy, and I know that there's an intimacy there. Um, personally, I think it's a little bit too familiar, or I'll say it this way in light of what's about to be said, not reverent enough when praying to say, Daddy. He is our Father. He is our provider. He is our protection. He is our guide. He is the one to whom we look for, look to for the things that we need. And he promises to be those things as we'll see later in another lesson. But I want us to be mindful that we don't want to be flippant in our relationship. It is one thing to note that the God of the universe, the creator, will look down on us and want relationship with us, and we can be intimate with him. I mean, even the psalmist thought about this and said, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you even give him attention? The point there is that God is the big God, and yet he cares for us. In that respect, I want us to be in awe and be glad of what Jesus introduces us to with regard to God as Father, this God of the universe who created all things, who is Lord and sovereign over all things, allows us to have a relationship with, relationship with him. And by the spirit of adoption, we are his children. We are his cre creation, but we can become his children. I just want us to know that that still entails a reverence about it not an easy, flippant attitude about Jesus as daddy or God as daddy. We want to keep that in mind. He is our father and we respect him and we are in awe of him. And that'll come out in the next prayer um, petition, if you will. He is our father who art in heaven. Now, I just said it that way because of the old King James, who art in heaven or which art in heaven is the way the King James says it. Uh, it literally is the one being in heaven, the heavenly one. Now, that's his location. If you want to say it that way, we know that God can be in all places at all times. Um, but we know that His he is in heaven in the sense that he is creation. That's where he is reigning and ruling from. So we recognize the intimacy of calling him father. We also recognize his transcendence and that he is in heaven over us. And I know when we talk about heaven and earth and we talk about dimensions and we talk about directions and so forth, uh, in different realms, um, we use words like above and below and so forth. And uh, that's just, just helpful language. Um, he is in heaven. Part of what's going on here is that this is going to be part of a theme of Jesus, as we'll get to in a moment, with regard to the kingdom as he rules and reigns. Uh, part of it is also to recognize that he is the creator of heaven and earth. And so we're recognizing, at least from a particular, I don't want to use the big word phenomenological, but we want to use that word, the idea of we, uh, how we perceive things, what the phenomenon is, that we, we see Jesus talking about God as the one in heaven. He is above, he is beyond, but he also is um, in our presence, being everywhere. Heaven has to do with the fact that that's his place from which he reigns. We'll talk about heaven and earth again in a moment uh, in respect to what 
God, what Jesus is asking us to pray. But we know about the kingdom of heaven as a theme in the uh, book of Matthew, the kingdom of God in general as a central theme of Jesus' teaching. Matthew just uses the phrase kingdom of heaven a lot more. And so it fits in here with the prayer. The one who is in heaven, he is above all and rules over all. It is a beyond all. What we're doing here is we're identifying the person we're talking to. Father, our Father, the one who is in heaven, we're identifying the person we're praying to. And let me give you this quick aside. I, I, uh, I hadn't thought about this for this lesson, but I think it's curious. Not only are we talking to God, we are identifying who we're talking to. And what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. We are separating out God as the one specific to whom we are, dis to, to whom we are calling so as to distinguish ourselves from calling on any other God. Now, the Bible is very clear. There is only one God. The Bible is also very clear that people tend to engage in idolatry and worship other false gods. This is right up there in the mindset of Moses and God giving, giving Moses the, the Ten Commandments. There is, um, you are to worship God and God alone. There have You are not to have any other gods. You are to love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and your strength, all your heart, soul, and strength. Jesus added the word mind later, and I think that's an important addition to that first commandment, the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God. But it's right there also in the idea of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God, and he is a unity. He is a unity within the Trinity. We can talk about that in another lesson. But I think it's valuable here that in prayer, we are identifying the one to whom we pray. Now, we don't do that so as to think that as we're praying, we're talking to some other false god that doesn't exist. But I think it's valuable that there's a sense in which what we're doing as we're praying is we are acknowledging God. And as we acknowledge him, we are acknowledging his position as father and his place in heaven. But we also recognize we are, we, are, we are addressing the only God. There's more that I can say about that, and I would like to flesh that out a little bit more, but it's interesting. We always open our prayer. I usually open up our prayer with Heavenly Father. Um, that's legitimate. It's a takeoff on our Father who are in heaven or who, are, who is in heaven. The, the, the point is it's helpful to make that address. I'm not one to think that if you don't say that, that uh, your prayer may go to some other false god. I don't believe in those other gods, okay? There's only the one god. But there's some acknowledgement that's going on there. And we haven't even begun to talk about the um, the petitions yet. We will. I think it's a sense that we can reflect and acknowledge, I am talking to the creator of the universe. And he allows me to talk to him. And he wants to commune with me. He wants to hear what I have to say. Well, we want to pause and think about that for a moment. The God of the universe allows us to call him Father by virtue of our relationship with him in Christ Jesus. We also recognize of the new heaven and new earth that will come. We are talking to God, Yahweh, the Lord, the one who is the ever-existent one, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. We know that those same terms are used of Jesus in the Revelation. Think about who you're talking to is what I'm saying. And it's also good to acknowledge who we're talking to as we pray. Well, as we move forward, I know there's a lot more I can ponder on that, and I hope that you can sense the weight of what we're doing when we get into prayer to the Heavenly Father. There are three petitions here. And I'm going to give a sense of that third one, uh, maybe different from what you've heard before. It's not a violation of the text, may add some significance to the text if I'm right about this, but I want to point that out to you. Uh, the three petitions have to do with God's name, his reign, and his will. And these are all really tied in with one another. First, the, 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 the petition of hallowed be your name. Um, each of these um, phrases carries with it what's called a third-person imperative. Um, you can sense that a little bit here in the text. 
these are each commands still, though these are commands in the sense that they are requests. But these are requests related to things pertinent to God. Some have recognized that there are the three petitions related to God and our relationship with Him and His will for our lives, and then there are three petitions related to our needs and relationships with one another and so forth. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. Hallowed be your name. Your name be sanctified. Your name be made holy. Now, what's curious about that is that what we see here is in the... Um, each of these petitions, and I want to go through these individually, but as a group, each of these petitions has the verb first. Be hallowed. Come, or let come. Let be done. So we'll talk about that. Let be hallowed, or let be sanctified. Let come, and let be done. The verb comes first. Now, what we're doing here is we kind of blend that in our English translations. Hallowed be your name then your kingdom come, and then your will be done. Uh, in English, we can do that. But I think it's interesting that one way to look at this, to capture what Jesus is doing in presenting this, he's saying something like this, let be sanctified your name. Let come your kingdom. Let be done your will. Now, in English, we don't really have a third person command. There's a way to do that, and I'll do that in a second, and we see that in some of our translations. But what I want you to see is that Jesus, in this presentation, he gives us the verb first, then tells us what. And it's ultimately what is the part or the subject of that verb. So let is a way of conveying that third person uh, imperative. I don't like it sometimes because it's not strong enough. It often sounds like we're granting permission in English when we use the word let today. That's not what's going on. It's just an accommodation to the imperative in the third person. In other words, we're talking about something else being commanded. It's not like we command his name to be um, hallowed or sanctified. We don't command that his kingdom come. We don't command that his will be done. But certainly this this third person imperative idea as a prayer request is a desire that this happens. So acknowledging him as God or as Father, the one who's in heaven, then we have these three petitions related to God, these words of praise, these words of submission and so forth to God. Be sanctified your name. The name represented the person. God revealed himself to Moses as, as I am who I am. And we get the shortened version of that in the word Yahweh, the one who is the being one. Jesus prayed this in, the, um, uh, in his own prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17, when he talked about your, 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 your name be sanctified, that they would be sanctified in your word and so forth. Um, being holy, the the prayer request here, hallowed be your name, or let your name be sanctified or be made holy, is the idea of that. Jesus is telling us that we are asking the Father that his name be magnified and holy and reverenced. We're calling for and acknowledging the right of God to have his name sanctified, to be held in high esteem and high regard and reverence. The name represented the person. So we're not just talking about his name, Yahweh. We're talking about who he is in character, that the God that we're praying to be revered. Now, part of that is in our own life. What we're going to see here is also, I think, part of that is, as we'll see, uh, as I give you a little bit of a hint now, that it would be done in heaven as, or uh, in earth as well. Not just that we would be sanctifying his name in our lives, but that his name be sanctified, be made holy, be revered in the world. Your name be sanctified, your name be made holy, that people would look. We pray for God to be rightly worshipped, to be rightly praised, to be rightly revered, that we rightly be in awe of God. So what we're doing is we come into the presence of God, and we're able to do that because of the blood of Jesus, as the writer of the Hebrews says. We can come confidently and boldly to the throne, and we still acknowledge His holiness. We still acknowledge Him as Lord, and our first thought is, God be praised. God be magnified. His name be made holy. What does that mean? You know, if however familiar you want to make yourself with God by saying, Daddy, if you're praying the Lord's Prayer, immediately there is that backup and we're wow, I'm talking to the God of the universe. My prayer should be that his name be revered, that there be awe 
in knowing him and all in the very thought of him. So that when we come before God, we can have that immediate aspect of intimacy. But now we have that sense of, I am in the throne room of God. May his name be made holy in my own life, personally, in the way that I talk and think, in the way that I act, in the way that I respond to God, the way that I talk to God. But then also that it be among the people, that his name be magnified. So we want to come with a word of adoration and praise to God. We want to make sure that we're aligning our wills with his such that he deserves the praise and we give it to him. Make your name holy. Sanctify it. Then he goes on to say, pray that your kingdom come. Now, again, we said earlier that the idea of the kingdom of God is central to the teaching of Jesus. We are talking about being kingdom disciples here. We're talking about kingdom power. What does it mean to be a disciple in the kingdom of God? Here means one that we seek the kingdom. Now, one of the things that we see John the Baptist doing when he preaches is that he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. It's arriving. It's, it has come close. It has approached. It's close. Jesus preached the same thing, and then he taught his disciples to preach the same thing. Repent for the kingdom is coming. He will later talk about the fact that by his doing miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit, then they know that the kingdom is among them. It's in their midst. It's not fully come. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't ask us to pray that it come. He also, in the, um, the, the Last Supper, talked about not doing this again with them as much as he's wanted to do this with them. He knows that he will not do it again with them until he does it with them in the kingdom. What are we saying then? This again gives us a sense of the awe that we should have before God because we are talking to the king and praying about his kingdom. Your kingdom come. Come, let come your kingdom, your rule and your reign and your sovereignty over all. So may you be God that you deserve to be. And that means ruling and reigning in our hearts, ruling and reigning in the world and in the universe. This is rightly God's universe. And he will make all things right. He will set all things to correction. In the what we call the eschaton, in the last days, he will set all things new in the new heaven and the new earth. What we can be doing then until that happens is praying that his kingdom come. Continually praying that his kingdom come. Again, I have one more take on that as we get forward. But let me just emphasize again. We're talking to a king. And we're asking that his kingdom come. We're seeking him to rule and reign in our lives. Seeking him to rule and reign in the universe that he created. On the earth that he created. We know that the world does not worship him. We know that the world does not revere his name. We know that the world does not seek his kingdom. But we can pray for those things. And then thirdly, he says that your will be done. Be done your will. We pray that God's work that he has desired and he has purpose will be carried out. So what are we seeing in all three of these? And we can expand on this third one in a second. But what we're seeing in all three of these is our focus is on God, giving him the, the all, the worship that he deserves and desires. And then also focusing on who we are in that relationship. The flip side of that is we are his children. Uh, we are, if we want to use this language, we are his subjects in the kingdom. And we also submit to him. But it's submitting to a benevolent God. It's not a forced submission. It's the idea that we rightly turn ourselves into servants of God. And we recognize that we serve him. We are putting God in his place when we say, your name be made holy, your kingdom come. Your will be done. We are acknowledging his right in ruling, his right in reigning, his right in having his name revered, his right in that what he purposes is done in our lives. I often pray that my purpose, my, my will would align with God's will. And that's what we really want to pray. Lord, your will be done. And again, each of these. We can say this in a very personal level. In my life, may your name be made holy. In my life, may your kingdom continue to come. And in my life, may your will be done. The thing is, with this third petition, there is the add-on. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to give you again a sense of the original there. The original says, as in heaven, also on earth, or in the earth. The comparative 
part is heaven. We often align this statement with the last petition, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I still want to say it this way, be done your will as in heaven, so also on earth. Let me give you a sense of what I'm going for here. We often think of that on earth as it is in heaven, or as I like to say it, in as in heaven, so on earth. We tie that with that third petition. Now, punctuation in the Greek New Testament is an editorial de decision, and some, manu some editions of the Greek New Testament you might run into out there will make each of these three petitions separate. In fact, I'll talk to you about some of your English translations here as well. Um, but the first prayer, your name be made holy, period. Your kingdom come, period. Then your will be done, comma, as in heaven, so in earth. For the longest time, I have sensed that what's going on with this text is that we can conclude each of these petitions with the phrase, as in heaven, so on earth. Hallowed be your name, as in heaven, so on earth. Your kingdom come, as in heaven, so on earth. Now, we know his kingdom's already in heaven. It's often called the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Those are interchangeable. Um, we're not talking about two different things, because we know that in one parallel passage, Jesus can use the phrase kingdom of heaven. And when another, another gospel will report that same saying in the same context with the same people, and Jesus says kingdom of God. But it's the same thing. We know that they're the same. The point here is we know that God already rules in heaven. And then your will be done. Be done your will as in heaven, so on earth. We know his will is done in heaven. I want you to ponder that for a moment. Think about the phrase as in heaven, so on earth, not just as an expansion of that third petition, but as involving all three petitions. And uh, the what's called the SBL, Greek New Testament, Society of Biblical Literature, Greek New Testament, um, punctuates this in such a way as to allow for that kind of understanding. You know, I started thinking about this long before I thought about the punctuation. Um, but what you see in the that particular version of the Greek New Testament is uh, a comma. Hallowed be your name, comma. Your kingdom come, comma. Your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Maybe that adds a nuance and a new sense of, I don't know, reverence might be the word, or comparison, or the sense of awe, or the weight of what our prayer is. God's name is revered in heaven already. You can look at the book of Revelation, and when John reveals to us the throne room of God, the angels are praising God, the saints are praising God. Holy, holy, holy. Think of Isaiah in the temple, and he sees the vision, the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is praised in heaven. You know his kingdom rules in heaven, and you know his will is done in heaven. What Jesus is saying is, as we know those things are being done in heaven, may they be done here. And I think there's a twofold way of looking at that, not only personally in our lives, but also as a sense of looking for the consummation of the kingdom, where new heaven and new earth are given, and we know that in the end, God will be praised. God's kingdom will have come, and his will will have been done. Jesus talks about the kingdom coming. We see Jesus, um, or Paul, referring to Jesus in such a way as to note that he's truly God when he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. What Paul is doing there is taking phrasing from Isaiah with reference to God and now applying it to Jesus. My point in bringing that up here is that we know that God has begun to rule and reign. He always rules and reigns in one sense because he is God of the universe. But Jesus is talking about praying for that kingdom to come. That his name be hallowed, it be made holy, it be sanctified, it be revered, that his kingdom come, that his will be done. When he says, as in heaven, so on earth, there's a sense in which we're praying for God to consummate his kingdom where heaven and earth are one, new heaven and new earth. We're thinking of an eschaton, the last and the final, the goal to all to which all things are going. Notice then the weight of this prayer, focusing in on who we are in relationship to God, thinking about what his rule and reign is, not only in our lives personally, but in the universe. 
we're talking to the holy God of the universe and we can call him father, we still re reference and recognize his right to be revered, his right that we submit to him. He's a benevolent God. He's a good God. I don't want us to confuse the idea of submitting to God with what it means to submit to God in Islam. We submit to a God who loves us. And then we seek to do his will. And we pray that his will be done, that he rules and reigns in this world. So there's a lot more that we can say. We probably pondered a lot more than you thought. of, But I want us to think slowly about this. And as I said, there are many, many resources out there, many, many books that have been written that have broken down each of these phrases for us that we can think and ponder. I just want to give you this much to think about. And hopefully that nugget at the end, that the idea of as in heaven, so in earth, that can be applied to all three petitions, not just the last one. Your name be revered as in heaven, so on earth. Your kingdom come as it already is in heaven, so on earth. Your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Think about each of those prayer requests, these petitions as we go through. Uh, and, and each is a compact statement that has so much in it. No. Well, Let's think about all that's going on then with the next set of prayers. Um, what we're looking at then is focusing from God and who he is and what he deserves and desires and what is rightly his to petitions for ourselves. When we pray, we think about our relationship with God. We identify who we are in Christ through or in, through Christ in God through his Holy Spirit, that we can come before him. He has given us that spirit of adoption as sons and children and daughters of God. But it's also recognized that because he is our source, yeah, Tony Evans likes to refer to God as our source and other things as resources. I really, really like that a lot. We do know that God is the one who provides, and Jesus tells us to call God Father. We know what fathers do, they provide. And so what Jesus then does in this second part of the prayer is talk about things that we can pray for with regard to ourselves, not selfishly, because this also involves relationship with others. But I think it's important that what we're doing is not only acknowledging God as the Lord of the universe and that we submit to him, but we also know that we can call on him for the needs that we have. And there are certain kinds of needs that we have. I've labeled this in verses 11 through 13, praying for our provision, forgiveness, and protection. And I qualified that with a protection of a particular kind. He goes on to say, these three petitions, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the three petitions, give us this day our daily bread. The word for day there is each of these words for day and daily are take off of each other. They still can contain the word day, this day, the day, the bread for the day. Um, now, the three commands that are given in the petitions at the beginning of the prayer are third person. Be hallowed your name. Come or let come your kingdom. Be done your will. Each of us prays that. It's still a corporate prayer, as we mentioned. It's our Father. Um, there's that corporate element in these three petitions as well. But now the commands, the, the petitions are in the second person talking directly to God about what we want God to do for us. Not that we demand this of him. Scholars like to refer to these imperatives of, uh, of, as imperatives of request. They're prayer petitions. We're not going to tell God to do anything. Um, but we have the right to talk to God and ask. First thing Jesus says, we ask God to give us this day our daily bread. Now, there's a whole lot that's tied up in that. One uh, is the prayer, obviously, seeking to recognize God as the source, so we seek his provision. Uh, this day, our daily bread, there are a couple of things going on there. Um, maybe you haven't thought of this, maybe you have. Remember in the wilderness wanderings, God provided them the manna for that day, and then on Friday, miraculously, he provided enough manna for the Sabbath as well, so that there would be no, there would be no gathering, no working on the Sabbath, so that God put it in place to allow them to continue to honor the Sabbath, as they should, but it was given daily. And a lot in that culture, by design, or by, by culture, not by design necessarily, but by the way the culture worked, you worked for that day, you got paid that day, and you were able to then eat that day. 
what Jesus is saying is we can pray daily for our daily bread. Give us this day. Now there are another, there's something else tied up with that. And that is we we trust God for today. We know he has our tomorrows. We talked about the idea of, uh, or there's that idea of tomorrows we'll talk about when we get later on in the chapter. But he's saying uh, the bread for the day. Give us this day the bread for the day. He tells us not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its worries. Think about today. So what we can do is, Lord, say, Lord, we pray for the needs that we have today. Now, he's using the word bread then in a very generic sense. I mean, he calls himself later on uh, the bread of life, Jesus does. Um, so what he's talking about with regard to bread is the very sustenance of life. It is the staple of life. Many cultures have bread. We do in, in America, too. Bread is a staple. It kind of goes with everything. Some cultures, it may be rice. I remember reading in Don Richardson's book, um, I think it was, With Eternity in Their Hearts, it might be Peace Child, um, where it talks about uh, working with uh, an indigenous group of people, but they didn't have bread. So when he's trying to translate the Bible for them to understand, he comes up with whatever they have as their staple of life. It was some kind of gooey, gooky substance, but it was with their meals. And so he translated the Bible to say this gunk or this goo of life. Now, those weren't the words, but the point was um, he identified their staple, what was common to most of their meals. And the culture uh, in Judaism and the ancient world was bread. We still have that today in many places. But that's a rep representation of the things that we need. Give us this day the money we need to pay our bills. Give us today the money we need to eat. If you do it directly, Lord, give us the food that we need to eat today. Give us this day our daily bread. Think again of God providing in the wilderness the manna for that day. Lord, we trust you today for your provision. We can belabor that. We have a lot more to say. I don't want to make the lesson longer than it already is. I think this has been good to emphasize these things and to be reflective of these things. But I think you get the point. We pray about this day, the daily bread, the bread for the day. We pray that God make provision for us. He is our source. Secondly, this is getting in line with relationships. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Some translations will say, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, the idea of there's things that people, the, the word for debt there is that the idea of owing. There's an obligation. Something is owed. Notice what they, what Jesus teaches us to do. Then he teaches us to pray that we be forgiven. Now, I'm always working on projects. Some come to fruition. Some remain out there to be, to can be completed. I'm telling my students all the time, I'm working on this and I'm working on that. I've got lots of different things that I'd like to finish up. One of the things I've noted, though, when it comes to the idea of forgiveness is that the Bible teaches us about the forgiveness of the sin. Even though we may say, forgive us, the point is the word us there is in a case that while the word may take this case as a direct object, the real direct object, the real thing that's asking to be forgiven is the debt to be remitted, to be removed, to be let go, to be left. We don't want God to remove us. We don't want God to leave us. We want God to remove the sin or the reason for the separation between God and us. Forgive with respect to us our debts, as we also have forgiven with respect to others their debts. We remit the sin. We are the benefit or the beneficiaries of that. I don't want to go into a lot of detail there, but I do want us to think about it because we're always saying, God, forgive me, forgive me. What we want is the sin forgiven with respect to me. Forgive with reference to us the debts. Forgive our debts with respect to us that belong to us. Forgive, release, let go. Whatever is standing in the way of our relationship with you, Father, we pray that be gone. And we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The word there is forgive the sin. The direct object is the sin that gets forgiven. But it's right in that we seek to have relationship with God. We know that sin in our lives ends up being a hindrance in our relationship with God. So here, on the one side, 
where sin has been committed, we pray, God, forgive them. What owes, what debts we owe God, what trespasses we have committed against God, whatever sins we've committed against God, in that moment we acknowledge we need forgiveness. That's a theme in much of Jesus' ministry as well. He forgives people. Remember the paralytic that's lowered um, through the roof. First thing Jesus does when he sees the man lowered to the roof is your sins are forgiven. He's come to be healed, but his sins are forgiven. The fact that Jesus can forgive sins indicates his deity, that he can then easily, by virtue of, uh, he can demonstrate his right to forgive sin by his ability to heal. But he forgives sin. We're seeking restoration of relationship, a right relationship with God. So there's not only the need to be met with our daily needs, but there is the desire to be in right relationship. And whenever we sin, we seek God's forgiveness. John writes in First John, I've written these things, you not sin, but if you do sin, you confess your sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from every unrighteousness, every act that we commit. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now there's a comparison there, just like there is a comparison in the first three petitions. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Here's a comparison. Father, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, there's an assumption in the prayer that we have. But what Jesus is going to do after this prayer is expand on this idea of forgiveness. And we need to talk about that. It's one of those hard sayings that Jesus gives. But notice what I talk about with regard to forgiveness. Our need to be in right relationship with God and what we need to do to be in right relationship with God is seek his forgiveness when we sin against him. Then he goes on for the flip side of that. There's one is the aspect of we have already sinned. We want to be forgiven and we want then to be restored to right relationship with God. The other side is in advance of sin, what can we pray? Jesus says to pray this, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We'll talk about a couple of things there. We don't have time to get into a more discussion about this, but I do think it's important to recognize that in recent years, because of what uh, the Pope has said with regard to this prayer petition, he says he doesn't feel like it's appropriate to translate it, do not lead us into temptation. Because why would we ask God not to do something we know he's not going to do? Remember, James says that God does not tempt to sin, nor is he tempted by sin. So why would we ask God not to lead us into temptation or to prevent us from going into temptation when he never wants us to be tempted anyway? He, he or he is not going to tempt us in such a way as to, to, to see if we're going to sin or not. So I think it's in some way appropriate to think about that. I think what Jesus is saying here as a matter of course is that it's still appropriate that as we seek God as our guide, that we be, be, we be prevented from entering into that temptation. Now, what's interesting is that in the New Testament, the word for testing and temptation are the same word. Um, James can say that. Count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. Then later on, he's going to say, when you are tempted, do not blame God. The word for trial and temptation is the same word. What makes it distinct is the person and the motive behind the word. Testing is a testing of faith. Trials test our faith. The temptation is to see, to make us fall. God would never put us in a situation to watch to make us stumble. He tested Abraham. He did not tempt Abraham. We know that we're going to face temptation. What we can be praying is that God guide us in such a way as that we avoid the temptation. We know there's a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, but we can also be praying preemptively and proactively about seeking the right path. I think one way to look at this and you can tell me I'm wrong. If you believe you're, I'm wrong, that's okay. I think what it could mean is something like this. Lord, we know we're going to go through trials. May the trials we encounter never turn against us into a temptation to sin. And a part of that comes from what comes in the second part of this prayer petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We need God's guidance day by day. When I said the word protection had a certain quality to it, clearly we talk about protection against harm, but here we're talking about protection against sinning against God. We know when we sin, we can go to him and seek forgiveness by confession and repentance. But we can also pray in advance, Lord, help me to walk with you today in such a way that you are guiding me and directing my paths. Lead me not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. 
Let, let the things that we experience today not lead us to be tempted to sin, whatever that trial may be. So I think it's okay and to translate that word lead not, simply because that's what the word means is lead. But notice the flip side of that, deliver us from evil. When we encounter a situation as a trial that may be tempting, we seek deliverance from it. We seek rescue from it. That's the word there. Rescue us from evil. When we are in a situation where temptation is there, rescue us. As I just referenced a moment ago, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation that has come upon you that is not common to man, but with each temptation, God has provided a way of escape so that we can stand up under it. Paul is picking up on an idea here, deliver us from evil. Now, many of your translations are going to say, deliver us from evil. Some are going to say, deliver us from the evil one. It's very clear that there is an article in front of the word evil, which is an adjective, but you can make it a noun. So is it the evil one, or is it evil? Or as a, 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 a Christian apologist I like to listen to, Greg Kokel, um, president of Standard Reason, likes to say, he likes to pray at both the evil uh, and the evil one. Whatever it means, I want deliverance from it. And we know that evil comes from the evil one. So we want to pray for deliverance from both. Deliver us out of the hands, out of the temptation. Give us what we need to provide. Provide us what we need by way of protection so that we can avoid sin. We need to pray that daily because it's difficult to think of a day going by without sinning, whether it's in our mind or in our words or in our actions. We can pray this, though. When we're praying about God giving us our daily bread, when we're praying about forgiving our sins, we're praying about not being led into temptation but being delivered from the evil one. What we're praying is God's guidance in our lives, his provision and his guidance, and I put it this way, his provision, forgiveness, and protection. We seek his forgiveness. We want that relationship restored. Again, before we move on, notice that each of these petitions is corporate. Nothing wrong with praying it individually. Nothing wrong with asking for it individually. The issue is, though, that it's still a corporate idea. Give us this day. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us something that we pray together, which is interesting because what Jesus said was to pray privately, right? But now he's talking about praying corporately. It's still a petition of the people of God. It's also a petition of us individually as a person of God. Uh, go back and reflect on each of those petitions. What does it mean to hollow his name, to seek his kingdom to come, to seek his will be done as in heaven, so on earth? What does it mean? What does your daily bread mean today? What is it that you need to ask God for today? Uh, what is your daily bread? Where do you need to seek forgiveness? In line with your own forgiveness of others. We still have to talk about that. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What does that look like to you today? What do you need to confess to God that needs to be forgiven? What temptations do you face that you need to say, God, lead me out of this, direct me out of this, protect me and deliver me from this? There are many other things that we can pray. When we talk about this as a model prayer, when Jesus would pray like this, clearly he's not saying these are the only things you will say in prayer, but they are thoughts and ideas that we think about in prayer. Praying to God and who he is and praying about who we are in relationship with him and praying in relationship with others. Now, one of the things you note that the New American Standard 2020 does, as many other modern, menu, modern translations do, is they did not give us the doxology. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, the New American Standard, like others, will put that in a footnote. I think the NIV does that. Some even modern translations recognizing what's going on with this text still include it. Um, it's interesting that uh, I have a friend that when we the, when in a corporate setting, when the Lord's Prayer uh, is recited, uh, when we get to the doxology, he stops. He says, Jesus didn't say that. It's not in Matthew's original gospel. It's later edition. So he doesn't say it. We'll talk about that in a second. I just want you to recognize that the reason it's not there in modern translations is not because they don't like it. It's because what textual critics are trying to do, what people who are trying to translate the Bible are doing is wanting to look at the best manuscripts. What did Matthew originally write? And consensus is that based on the way the manuscripts have come down to us, the idea of the doxology was a later edition, likely a later edition based on something we find in an ancient document called the Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles, which has this prayer with 
the doxology added to it. So that's a good way to end it. Let's put it in there. Later manuscripts have that, and the majority of manuscripts have that. But did Jesus actually say to put that at the end of the prayer? Did Matthew's original gospel have that there? Likely not. No one's hiding anything. There's no conspiracy there. They put it in a footnote, recognizing that manuscripts have it. And beyond that, we know that the idea of doxology and prayer is it's, it's implicit. It's ubiquitous, I should say it that way. First of all, it's a given. What I mean by implicit, it's a given that there's going to be praise to God. The Psalms are filled with praises to God. The word doxology is a word of praise. Um, we're going to read one in a moment that's one of the highest senses of doxology in all of the Bible. Um, the New Testament's full of doxologies. You can go and look up doxologies of the Bible and see all these places of words of praise to God, words of praise to Jesus, words of praise to the Holy Spirit. So there's a room for that. Um, so there is the sense in that it's implicit, it's there. But it's also ubiquitous. And what I mean by that is doxologies are everywhere in the Bible. So clearly giving a word of praise to God for who he is, thanksgiving for what he's done, is characteristic of prayer, what we would say in a prayer. The point is that your modern Bibles often will put that in a footnote because the best manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, does, do not have that. There are liturgical or worship reasons why it was added later. It was added in other parts of documents and thought, oh man, a scribe may have said, wow, that's a good way to end a prayer. Maybe he wrote it in a margin himself and it got put into a later manuscript. It's okay to say it, though. I think it's okay, given the fact that there are doxologies all over the Bible. So we'll come back and, and look at that in a second. What I want to do is real quickly get to um, a passage that I think is interesting. First uh, Chronicles uh, chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. Uh, this is uh, David near the end of his life. He's not going to build the temple himself. His son is going to build the temple. Uh, Chronicles tells us that David was a lot more involved in the gathering of building materials at the beginning stages than the book of uh, 2 Samuel indicates and that 1 Kings indicates. But certainly what we have here in David's prayer is a blessing upon the temple and a, an acknowledgement of his son. But the prayer opens up with this kind of doxology. We have 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in, in the heavens and on the earth, yours is the dominion, Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Wow, have you prayed something like that? How long ago or how often has it been that you've said those words or heard those words? I would encourage you to go back. Yes. Doxology is part of prayer. But notice in this prayer of David, even elements that we find in Jesus' model prayer. I just want to give you that verse reference again. You can go back and read it on your own. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 13. There's a place for doxology in the Bible. Now, what's interesting is I mentioned this in a previous lesson um, with the vain babblings and repetitions and so forth. Um, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, the parable of the, 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 the tax collector and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee prays basically about himself. I call it the anti-prayer. Um, he talks about their fasting twice a week. That's why I talked about it there. I bring it up here. It's a background passage for our lesson today. But the idea there is who are we praying to? And what are we praying about? That Pharisee in Jesus' parable prayed about himself. Whereas the tax collector recognized his inadequacies, his insufficiencies. Um, he recognized who he is in relationship to God and sought forgiveness. He sought God, whereas the Pharisee in that parable was seeking to elevate himself, praying about himself. There are other things you can talk about and think about. Um, you, As you read about the Lord's Prayer, you'll find other ways that these different 
um, petitions can be categorized and how they can be labeled and such. I hope the way we've done it uh, has been helpful today. Um, I want to encourage you, as we will at the end, to pray the prayer, but also use it as a way of thinking about the kinds of things we want to pray about. Many, many things to ponder there. Before we go, though, we need to look at verses 14 and 15, what uh, in my own personal notes I said, an addendum, but then I have given you in the outline the phrase, strong words on forgiving others. We can look at the Lord's Prayer, and some have done this, to see how different elements of the Lord's Prayer uh, are expanded in other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Sometimes we have to be careful not to press that too much, to be looking for things that aren't really there, but I do think that you can find places that Jesus talks about things that relate to what we find in the prayer. What we're seeing directly here is a reference to a petition of prayer, forgive us our sins as we, as also, as we also have forgiven others. Jesus then stops down after giving the Lord's Prayer and gives this very strong word. If you forgive other people, literally people, if you forgive people for their offenses, their trespasses, their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people or other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. So let that sink in. I don't want to belabor this point. I think it's important, though, that we recognize Jesus' strong words here. I say that it's a harsh saying. We've already been forgiven. Paul says in Colossians that we need to be forgiving of one another because God has forgiven us. We know about the parable of the unmerciful servant who was in great debt to the king, sought to get more time to pay back. The king just went ahead and forgave him massive amounts, more than 100 lifetimes of, of, of debt. Find someone who owes him something and demands that he get paid back. He's unforgiving. When he's not forgiving, the king rescinds his forgiveness, if you will, forgive the forgiveness of his debt and puts him in prison. Jesus is saying something about the character of God that is difficult for us to grasp. But he also puts into bold relief, if you will, puts into strong context what it means to be forgiving. We've already prayed, Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we also forgive those or as we have forgiven those who have debts against us. The correlation there, the connection, your forgiveness of others. Um, is the foundation upon which you can then ask God to forgive you. We already know, though, that in coming to Christ and salvation, He is the initiator of forgiveness. So there's the flip side of that. We can only forgive because God has forgiven us, and we are encouraged and given an example of forgiveness because we have been forgiven. But now in the prayer, Jesus says that we can pray, forgive us as we have forgiven. Notice the qualification there. Where there's unforgiveness in our heart, can we truly expect God to be forgiving of us when we he has already forgiven us so much? But Jesus makes it a point to then make this comparison, the rationale in the part of the prayer about forgiveness. He says, if you forgive other people, their offenses, their trespasses, their violations against us, their sins against us, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, then your Father will not forgive you or forgive your offenses. Uh, of the various components of the prayer, I think it's interesting, Paul or Jesus expands on this particular part at this point. There are other things that we'll see that coincide with the prayer, I'm sure. But at this point, he expands on that. Um, the word for debt is the one word in the prayer. The word for offenses or trespasses is a different word. But the idea there is, as I said, the word violation. We have, uh, someone has, been in violation of us by stealing from us, by hurting us. There are a number of ways that someone can sin against us. As I said, believers, as believers, precedent has been set for us in that we have already received the love and forgiveness of God. That's the basis upon which we can forgive others and the, the context in which we can have the ability to forgive others. But it also becomes the foundation for seeking God's forgiveness. This is a very harsh word that I said, stern words that God withholds forgiveness from us if we withhold forgiveness from others. The relationship that we have with others impacts our relationship with God and vice versa. A very hard saying, as I said, uh, I've said throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us hard things to think about. He gives us hard words, strong words, 
and he's saying a hard thing here. It might catch us by surprise to see this right on the heels of this wonderful model of prayer that he gives us. Uh, does it seem to come out of nowhere to you? Why does Jesus bring it up now? Why does he expand upon this? Uh, I think he recognizes that we need to be in right relationship with others. By virtue of our salvation, we are in right relationship with him. Therefore, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God. While we were enemies, God or the Christ. Jesus has initiated, God has initiated that reconciliation process. As we have been reconciled to God, we seek reconciliation with others. If we withhold reconciliation from others, then God can say, hold up. You, after all that I've done for you, you're going to withhold forgiveness from someone else. It's a harsh saying. We need to recognize that our relationship with others is reflective of our relationship with God. And that is not always a positive thing. I've often said that when we pray, Something like this, Lord, may my relationship with you be reflected in my relationship with others. The reality is it already is. And that's either a positive or a negative. If I'm having difficulty in my relationship with others, I need to check my relationship with God. Certainly when my relationship with God is in right order, that will facilitate my relationship with others. Notice what Jesus is doing here in that prayer petition. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. If we do not forgive the trespasses against us, the Father will not forgive us. That's not an image of God we often think about. We think of the loving, caring God who just accepts us as we are. And there is truth to that, but there are expectations. We need to be forgiving of others. I think it's very important that you reflect upon what does it mean to forgive. We've already talked about some applications. We've looked at the prayer. I think you can think of some application with regard to forgiveness Perhaps you need to be thinking today about who it is you need to forgive. There are other things about forgiveness Jesus talks about. He says when you're at the altar giving your offering, if someone has an offense against you, go make it right. Uh, clearly, if someone has wronged you, then you seek to forgive them. You forgive them. Jesus said to Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. The point there is as often as they seek forgiveness, you forgive. We all are in relationships with people, whatever that relationship may be. It may be work, it may be romantic, it may be friendship, it may be family. We all wrong each other. And what Jesus is saying is we need to have the attitude of forgiveness. Because our inability, our, our lack of desire, our lack of action in forgiving others is going to impact our relationship with God. As a side note then, and this is not to put anyone on, on alert, uh, it's just a thought that comes to mind. If you are feeling distant from God, could it be that you're harboring bitterness and unforgiveness against somebody, and that's in some way a block on your relationship with God? Seek to forgive. Open the door for God to work in your life, even as he has forgiven you. Well, it's a privilege to have a conversation with the creator of the universe we do it with reverence. We can have it with intimacy. With a prayer, we can pray individually. We can pray it as a corporate body. We can pray it and recite it. We can use it as a model for the different things that we can pray about. And there are many other templates and many other thoughts about prayer. Jesus says that we have a right relationship with God. We have a relationship with God that we can talk to him. He speaks to us through Jesus and his word. We speak back to him. One of the things I'd like to do as we conclude the videos, I'm going to post a link in the description um, of the prayer sung in a couple of different renditions. As we conclude this prayer, though, or this lesson, I do want to conclude with the, the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to say it in the way that I learned it, um, which is worded slightly different from what we've seen in the New American Standard, but I think it's valuable. And if you would like to, Go along and follow with me as this is our closing prayer for the lesson before we look at what's coming up in the next lesson. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who have been indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we get ready, moving forward through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we want to look at what's coming next.
In next lesson, the question we're going to deal with is God or wealth? Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. And there are really three topics that are going to be discussed there, um, where your treasure is, uh, what your eyes look at, and then ultimately, who are you going to serve? And that's the question there, God or wealth, God or mammon, who are you going to serve? We'll talk about that in those brief verses there. They're lumped together in one type of topic that we'll talk about, but there are three separate kind of examples that Jesus talks about there, but they all can be wrapped up under one heading. And we'll talk about that in our next lesson. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for walking with me through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I want to encourage you to continue to read the Sermon on the Mount, to reflect upon that, to be challenged by it. Jesus is not giving us something easy to do. He's calling us into discipleship, and discipleship is hard. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do these things. I pray that you pray the Lord's Prayer as a model or as a reciting uh, template by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Until our next lesson, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace.